All right. Um, well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm afraid you guys get another nuclear engineering talk today. Uh, sorry for that. But um, mine's a little different than what many of you in the room probably do in that, except for generating reference results, uh, none of it is supercomputing. It's all about modeling complex systems on relatively small computers. Uh, so I'll just jump right into what I'm doing and why. Uh, nuclear power is obviously very important. It's clean, cheap, reliable, uh, and abundant enough to meet our growing demand for electricity. Uh, but of course, before we build any, uh, any reactor, we need to model it to make sure we understand how it's going to operate. And after it's built, we need to continue to model it to make sure we uh, continually operate it uh, safely and economically. Uh, so I'll just introduce some terminology really quick uh, that comes up in reactor analysis. Uh, let's see, where's my laser? Is there a laser? Ah, here we go. Uh, so the first thing is um, the neutron flux. It's very closely related to uh, the density of neutrons at any point in phase space, but it's actually uh, the total distance traversed by neutrons per unit volume per time. Uh, it can be angle dependent, or you can integrate over angle to get the scalar flux. And then we have this macroscopic cross-section, which is just the probability per unit length that a neutron will undergo an interaction. So if we multiply probability per unit length by the total length traversed by neutrons, we get uh, all the reaction rates that are happening inside the core. So uh, for this reason, calculating the scalar flux is very important because it tells us every reaction that's going on in the reactor. And finally, there's the neutron multiplication factor or reactor eigenvalue, uh, or simply K for short. And k equals 1 just means that the neutron population is stable. Uh, greater than 1 means neutron population is increasing, and less than 1 is decreasing. Uh, so this is a very important uh, quantity defining the reactor. Uh, so how do we solve for this important quantity, the scalar flux? Well, uh, we have the transport equation uh, in slightly simplified form here. This is basically a balance equation with leakage and loss due to collision on the left side. On the right side, we have gains from neutrons scattering into some point in phase space and uh, neutrons being born from fission. Uh, and we can solve this equation to an arbitrary degree of accuracy using any number of stochastic or deterministic methods. Uh, but doing so is very expensive. So for example, a pressurized water reactor uh, has about 200 fuel assemblies, 289 pins per assembly. And if we wanted to discretize that with 50 radial mesh zones per pin, 400 axial zones, 100 angles, and 100 energy groups, that's already 10 to the 13th unknowns. And this is only to get the flux. This isn't coupled to a thermal hydraulics code, which you would really need to do for real reactor analysis. Uh, and this is steady state. So if you want to do transients or accent analysis, uh, things get very expensive. And there are several DOE labs that are working towards full core transport solutions. Uh, but in general, the companies that build, operate, and design these reactors uh, aren't interested in spending that much time computing. They want something more uh, faster. So what we instead solve is the diffusion equation. Uh, we arrive at this equation by applying some angular approximations to the transport equation. And in doing so, we eliminate the angular variable completely. Uh, unfortunately, because of the approximations, the exact solution can no longer be obtained. But it turns out, um, for reactor analysis, the assumptions we make are pretty good. Um, in general, this diffusion coefficient here, uh, typically it's a scalar quantity. It's, it's related to this uh, transport cross-section. Uh, but in general, it could be a tensor. Now even still, this diffusion equation is still too large to solve on the same fine mesh that we would maybe solve the transport equation on. So we need to solve the diffusion equation on a coarse mesh. Uh, we're going to take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of repeated structures in a reactor. Uh, so what we can do is perform transport solutions on these small repeated structures and get a detailed solution, uh, and then use those detailed solutions to generate homogenized cross-section data and diffusion coefficients uh, for these coarse mesh regions. Then we solve the diffusion equation for the full core using the coarse mesh and the homogenized cross-sections. Uh, when we do that, we lose all our fine spatial information uh, because it's all been homogenized. Uh, so we need to somehow reconstruct detailed fluxes. We do that by 
basically multiplying the normalized lattice solution from step one for each of our uh, homogenization regions, multiply that by the full core solution, and we end up with uh, something with a little more fine detail. Uh, now the problem is uh, homogenized cross sections are uh, well defined, but the definition of a homogenized diffusion coefficient is ambiguous. So we seek to uh, address that with the asymptotic diffusion equation. And again, we're going to take advantage of the fact that nuclear reactors have a lot of repeated geometries. Uh, for instance, fuel pins in an assembly or assemblies in the core. Uh, so we're uh, going to do a kind of perturbation analysis where our unperturbed system is an infinite periodic medium made of, of a single repeated structure. Uh, we perturb the system such that it's large but finite. And then we define two spatial scales. Uh, little l is the period of a lattice, so maybe that's the width of a single fuel pin. Or a large l is the total size of the perturbed system. And we then consider the limit of the transport equation as the ratio of those two length scales goes to zero. And then what we expect is that locally the solution will have the periodicity of the lattice, uh, but globally it'll have some small gradient. Uh, and this is exactly consistent with the flux reconstruction we were doing earlier. So we've already been making this assumption, essentially. Um, so if we look at the limit of the transport equation, we arrive at a homogenized diffusion equation uh, where the homogenized cross-sections are completely standard, flux-weighted cross-sections. But now this diffusion coefficient is a tensor instead of a scalar. It obviously uh, looks much more complicated. But for a homogeneous medium, this reduces to 1 over 3 times the transport cross-section, which we saw earlier. Um, these f functions are uh, lattice functions. f0 is actually the solution. It's exactly the lattice solution we talked about earlier. So that is the transport solution to uh, one of these smaller homogenization regions. f1 is a transport solution to a related fixed source problem that I won't define in any detail here. Uh, and then the capital F's just indicate that we've integrated over angle. And a star indicates that there's a, it's an adjoint solution, which Hayes was uh, introduced us to earlier. Um, uh, adjoint functions have another interpretation, which is the importance of a neutron at some point in phase space. So that means this diffusion coefficient now has some importance weighting to it. Uh, and finally, the asymptotic analysis gives us a method of reconstructing the angular flux. If we look at the leading order terms of the asymptotic expansion, we see we have the completely standard flux reconstruction, which is our lattice shape function times the full core diffusion solution. But we now have an order epsilon correction term here that we can include. It's uh, proportional to the gradient of the global solution. Uh, what that tells us is that in the center of the reactor, where the solution isn't changing very much, the correction term probably isn't very significant. But towards the periphery of the core, where your solution is changing more rapidly, uh, the correction term will become more significant. Uh, so a brief note on implementation. Uh, in 1D, I just have a couple of test codes, a transport and diffusion code. In multi-D, uh, I implemented the lattice calculations and homogenization into the impact code, which is one of Michigan's primary contributions to the Consortium for Advanced Simulation of Light Water Reactors. That's a big Oak Ridge project for modeling reactors using transport. Um, and then uh, finally, my own diffusion code, uh, diffusion for immediate results, not because of how fast it runs, but because of how quickly I had to write it. And, um, the, you can tell, actually, that we're nuclear engineers because all of these codes uh, including this brand new production code, could have been written in any language. Uh, we chose to write them all in Fortran. Uh, thank you for not booing, but um, it's, uh, it's object-oriented Fortran 2003, so hopefully that'll soften the uh, disappointment that we're keeping it alive. Um, finally, some results. Uh, we have one D problem based on something Eli Gelbard looked at when he was studying some non-standard diffusion coefficients back in 67. Uh, it's loosely based off the zero power plutonium reactor, which was an experimental reactor at uh, Argonne West, or INL now. And the first thing we'll look at is the error in the reactor eigenvalue, the multiplication factor. 
the errors are shown in PCM by convention, uh, so that's thousands of a percent. Uh, and we see that for different size systems, so different number of fuel plates, uh, in every case, the asymptotic diffusion coefficient gives us a better estimate of the eigenvalue, so that's good. We then look at the reconstructed fluxes, and this is a plot of the reconstructed flux divided by the uh, transport solution. Um, and so ideally, of course, this would be one everywhere, uh, but it's not. You can see that these methods are giving similarly accurate results. Uh, you might say standard is slightly worse because it's trending down from one just a little bit more. Uh, but they're both reasonably accurate. But if we include this order epsilon correction term, then we see here at the center line of the reactor, on the right side, the correction term doesn't really matter that much. But as we move towards the periphery of the core, uh, we've almost completely eliminated this oscillating error uh, that is growing as we move away from the center of the core. So that's very good. Uh, finally, we'll look at a 2D problem. This is uh, kind of based off a well-known numerical benchmark called the C5D7 benchmark. Um, it's a seven energy group problem. Uh, the last problem was just a single energy group. And it's really a challenge problem for this method because the method is designed for a single repeated structure. Now we're using um, different fuel enrichments. And we've got instrument instrumentation and uh, structural materials in here. And we surround the whole thing with a water moderator. So we'll really see if this method uh, is useful for reactor analysis. Uh, first thing we look at is just a plot of the uh, highest energy group, the flux in the highest energy group. Uh, this is the transport solution. And this is not the reconstructed flux, but just the diffusion solution. Uh, I have not yet done the reconstructed fluxes for these multi-D problems. But you see, we're getting uh, the global behavior pretty good, but we've lost all this fine spatial detail uh, from our homogenization regions. And again, the thermal or uh, slowest energy group. So you see neutrons come out into the water and slow down. So we get these big peaks out here. Uh, diffusion's doing a good job getting the peaks outside the core, but we've lost all the fine spatial detail in our homogenization regions. Uh, so what can we look at since I haven't done the flux reconstruction yet? Well, we can look at assembly powers uh, in each of these six assemblies, 17 by 17 assemblies. What we see here is uh, the top numbers are the uh, normalized assembly powers from a transport solution. The bottom numbers are the relative errors between the diffusion power and the transport power. Uh, the color simply indicates the magnitude of the error. And we see that for all six assemblies, the asymptotic diffusion method is giving us a slightly better estimate of the assembly power. Uh, so a couple of brief conclusions. Um, through asymptotic analysis of the transport equation, we've derived a non-standard homogenized diffusion equation. Um, we have found an order epsilon correction term that we can add to our reconstructed fluxes, and including it can significantly increase the accuracy of your detailed fluxes, so on a within pin level. And that could offer significant benefits if you want to do things like fuel depletion or uh, long-term irradiation damage. Uh, the asymptotic diffusion coefficient can give more accurate power distributions. Uh, all I showed here was reflected cores, meaning the water surrounding the fuel region. Uh, there's still work that I'd like to do for bare reactors. That's purely academic because you never have a bare reactor, but um, we need more analysis to make sure we have the right boundary conditions for these lattice problems. Uh, so future work is to continue testing of boundary and interface conditions perform flux reconstruction for the multi-D problems, uh, develop and improve treatment uh, for the diffusion coefficient in non-multiplying media, by which, again, I mean the reflector uh, or the moderator outside the uh, core regions. And then we'd like to extend the asymptotic analysis to more general angular approximations. So instead of just diffusion, uh, other spherical harmonics expansions, PN and simplified PN. I'd like to thank my advisor for all he's taught me over the past few years, uh, the impact team for uh, letting me implement this work in their code. Uh, Brendan Kachunas runs uh, 3D problems for me on Titan, because uh, he has a bunch of time on there. 
uh, SSGF fellow Tommy Seller uh, played a big role in helping implement the method into Impact. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank the CSGF and Krell Institute for all the amazing support. So with that, I'll take any questions.